last minute or even. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 105 in our series since we began in March of 2020 in response to the pandemic, as you many would know, and uh, have carried on since. So uh, let me just bring up the page here. Okay. Uh, we are on the road. We're out of town, but it's immaterial because we're on the internet, which is you know always in town pretty much. If you're if you have a connection, which uh, many of us take for granted because we've had it for so long, but there's still billions of people who lack connectivity. Uh, this has been a project that uh, IFLA, our partner here, and uh, Gigabit Libraries has been working on for a number of years to close that digital divide uh, for every community. Every community should have a robust connection like a library where people could go and access the internet and do all the things that it, that it does. So uh, that led us here eventually. It's a long story. I'll skip it. But uh, today we are uh, uh, happy to have uh, Akash Guglani, Policy Manager of the Digital India Foundation, who we'll get to momentarily. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we're a 14-year-old uh, open consortium of uh, libraries doing interesting things, we think, with technologies, uh, leading-edge technologies. Uh, a lot of our focus has been in communications technologies, uh, fiber and then wireless, all kinds of different wireless technologies, and recently uh, in uh, in relation to AI, which we'll get to. Uh, IFLA is our longtime partner in producing this series, and we're happy to work with Stephen. Uh, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA, is our, uh, our, our host and is recording the session, which, like all of our sessions, will be posted on the uh, Libraries in Response YouTube channel for a replay. We've had over over 10,000 people register for the series, and I think over 11,000 have watched the episodes on YouTube, which always surprises me that people are ready to go back and watch these again, or if they missed it, which I know a lot of people do. Uh, so that's gratifying. Our sponsor, happily to, to add, is uh, uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the federal library agency in the U.S., which is helping us this year with uh, financial support. Thank you, IFLA. We also have sponsorships from the Internet Society uh, and the Libraries of Michigan, New Jersey, and Texas. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, libraries. State libraries are a special focus of ours. Uh, as you would know, we're doing a project called the Slate State Libraries and AI Technologies Project. Uh, we briefed on it a couple of times. It's it's going pretty strong. It's basically how to develop a strategic approach to something that is not very well defined and certainly not predicted in terms of its impact. I mean, it's predicted, but uh, the accuracy is a question. Uh, we also get uh, media sponsorship from Library Journal and from Broadband Breakfast. Thanks to everybody. So we started out in response to the pandemic. Every, everything was closed down. And we asked the question, well, what is a library if the building is closed? It's not nothing but what? And that, of course, started a conversation about what exactly is a library in general and now or now being then and, and in the future. And so that has just continued on uh, with a lot of different uh, topics, but all under the general heading of libraries responding to crisis. So this is a health crisis. And of course, we have the ever pervasive climate crisis. These are just, you know, some of our frightening images of the, the horrors that are brought about by these radical changes in the climate. This, uh, uh, this top right picture is a, a picture from Iowa after a derecho, something I'd never heard of, a, a phenomena, hurricane force winds blowing hundreds of miles uh, across, straight across the landscape at, at hurricane force. 
Uh, this one uh, wiped out 40% of the Iowa corn crop in one night, just like that. We have drought, floods, fires, hurricanes. It's, you know, it's the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse. But how do, how do libraries deal with that? How do libraries help their communities cope with all that, adapt to that? There's certain mitigation you know, things that need to happen, but it's too late to not have these serious impacts. So we're in adaptation mode, which scales. Mitigation has to happen kind of at every scale, but adaptation is scalable down to the individual, the household, and certainly the community, which should have a strategy for this stuff. I just pulled this up, you know, 30 minutes ago. This is a uh, a map, a heat map of the U.S., and these are number of days since record temperatures in these locations across the entire country. It's, I think it's getting people's attention. I, if it's not, I don't know what will. Maybe a, maybe a comet hitting the planet would do it. An asteroid uh, might get people to pay it, but they, they wouldn't, they go, well, it, what does it have to do with me? They would say that. So all of these add up to actually a um, a, a cascade of crises, the health crisis, the climate always there. Now we have war, we have AI, which is we consider a new crisis because it's disrupting society in, in a very similar way as the pandemic did in terms of it's everywhere all at once. And when I say it's arrived, I'm talking in terms of sort of end user impact. I mean, AI has been around for a long time, embedded in systems, but now it's in the hands of, of end users. And that is new. Uh, boon or doom is a, is a pervasive question. So we've done, we started doing series on AI in 21, and we've done over a dozen, I believe, so far. These are all, of course, on the YouTube channel for anyone interested to go back and go through that. Um, it's an interesting, really interesting. This has been our most interesting topic, perhaps. And, and today, today, again, we'll be delving into it. Uh, this is a previous uh, presenter we had, Nathan Sanders uh, with the Brookings Institute, uh, came on and talked about uh, public AI, public access infrastructure, however you want to uh, term it, the idea that there are um, two current pervasive models uh, for AI. Uh, one is the Silicon Valley model and the other is the China model. And these are not necessarily acceptable to a lot of people, no matter where they are. Uh, the question for us is what then is the role of libraries in this new event, this new upheaval? Uh, librarians as uh, as co-designers of, of uh, AI, trainers, monitors, teachers. These are more or less traditional things, guarantors, some, someone that can say this information is trusted or we don't know if this is trusted, trustable, trustworthy. So librarians seem to react strongly to this uh, phenomena, I guess, because it's information centric and this is where librarians live. So it's a, a question that we're pursuing and uh, this will be part of it today. Uh, I wanted to kind of go back. This has been a common reference that people have made. Is this, is this like the 1990s and the arrival of the World Wide Web? And thinking about it, I would say, well, yes, yes, but you know, it's also it's more than that. It's deeper than that. And kind of tracing back the the cultures that arrived that have brought us this to this moment, which I've participated in, is it, it, kind of interesting in the sense that uh, in the eighties, or actually in the late seventies, Steve Jobs and others hacked the mainframe architecture and built small computers and desktops uh, that also had graphical interfaces rather than just the you know command line uh, uh, interface that we'd seen before. That was a big change and that that uh, uh, that transformed computing. And it also transformed uh, the region of Silicon Valley. Before that Silicon Valley, 
had really been about silicon, the, the chips that ran the mainframes. Mainframes were built basically by IBM. They built either, they either built everything or the companies that built such machines emulated IBM. That means they built the, the machine, the operating system, the applications, all of it. And it, it was all proprietary. And then the, the, well, it wasn't called the PC. It was called the microcomputer after the mini computer, which was a mainframe technology that was smaller and cheaper by an order of magnitude. But the same kind of thing, people connected to terminals, connected to a central computer. Uh, uh, until the the autonomous independent microcomputer that was a breakthrough before the PC as a machine that ran a common operating system, or at least that was a proposal a lot of them did, so-called CPM, that different machine makers could make machines that ran this operating system and, and application developers could develop applications that ran on that operating system. And so they converged at this, uh, at this point, that same architecture is what uh, I, it caught IBM's attention, but it, there was, these machines were treated as like incidental, you know, not real computing, like chiclets uh, you know, stuff. So the fellows at IBM wanted to, uh, get into this, but the the upper echelon said, "No, this is this is trivial. We sell we sell million dollar machines. We don't sell ten thousand dollar machines. There's no money in that." And so these fellows at IBM said, "Well, let us assemble it. We don't build it. We'll just get everything off the shelf. We'll get the machines, operating systems from somewhere, and and we'll just do that. And and, and it won't cost us anything. Some little marketing money." And they said, okay, on that condition, you can do it. So they started looking and they found Bill Gates. And he said, absolutely, here's DOS. Go ahead, license it and do whatever you can. And, and so they did. And that was the birth of the PC. And then it exploded uh, later in the 90s uh, with the arrival of the, uh, uh, the World Wide Web, which, of course, is a graphical interface part that sits on top of the internet, which had been created a couple of decades before as a, as a communications protocol. So that was a big deal that uh, these machines were now connected. The problem, of course, was the connections were ordinary telephone lines that didn't carry much data at all. So that was the bottleneck for a while. Still, in many places, it's the bottleneck. But as more fiber, as faster wireless uh, come on to, to being, uh, that's less and less of, a, of an issue. A lot of fiber has been laid. And it was actually the investment in fiber from the 90s that was the, the, the big economic explosion from that. Not, not so called the dot-com bubble or boom, but it was the telecom boom. Billions, tens of billions of dollars were invested in global fiber uh, on the prediction that this would change everything, which in fact it did. First, the, the web was just a place people hung out before that, we had some graphical uh, standalone uh, experiences in CD-ROM titles, really fast, cool things that you could run and, and navigate in, a, in an online, well, your own machine world, but they weren't connected to anything. And so uh, the, the internet came along, the web came along and started to do that. There wasn't much out there, but just exploring it, the act of exploring and looking and finding new stuff Posting hyperlinks uh, was a competitive thing that, that people were fascinated by. And it just grew from there. Uh, then it became a communications vehicle for commerce. And then it uh, became embedded in, in transactions and commerce. And then government around 2000 picked up the, the uh, uh, e-government uh, 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 approach. And it, and it just went on from there. And it's, and it's still going. At that same time in the 90s, uh, China, well, like everywhere, took an interest in it. And China had an advantage. There was practically nothing. There was no, no communications, no real, not much commuting, 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 computing in China at the time. But that allowed them to implement the very latest technology. They were a clean slate, as it were. So they just brought in the latest technology at that time, as opposed to, say, the U.S. and Europe, which had 
legacy technologies, they had to replace these much slower. People don't want to do that unless they're just forced to, or some advantage is so clear. So it was it was slower than it needed to be. But China had nothing standing in the way to adopt the latest technologies. And uh, we were involved. I was involved in a software startup uh, in, uh, in, in China and Japan. And we brought uh, web tools, authoring tools, and streaming tools to China. We were, our motivation was that China had to transcend the industrial economy, the, the unsustainable industrial model. Had, we had to go past that to the so-called information age. And helping them do that seemed like it was in everybody's best interest, because if they didn't, then it wouldn't matter what anybody else did. The problem with that is that you don't replace systems overnight. You bring in, you automate, and it accelerates the old system. So China began to do the industrial model at very, very high speed. They still are, but they've also begun to change. Uh, we were also hopeful that you that China wouldn't be able to control everything the way it always had been because this technology was just so you couldn't both control it and then use it for for economic benefit well china's proven that they actually can do that uh to the surprise of many of us but there we are so that's a cultural track for the internet that has led to today as one of the primary you know options there are the 10 largest technology companies in the world are either american or Chinese. The American story, of course, was that the 90s boom brought thousands of young men into the Bay Area to follow Steve Jobs, more or less, and start up companies and build software and, and the rest of it. Uh, and uh, with an enormous opportunity to make uh, unbelievable amounts of money. And that's what we witnessed in uh in the years since is these gigantic companies didn't exist 20 years ago or are only beginning to and now they're the biggest companies in the world by a lot and they control our infrastructure so this is our choice this is our topic today is we have two versions two dominant versions of of the internet uh, and that is the silicon valley version that is pretty much run by a, uh, well, I'll have to say what I think is a, a kind of an immature bro culture, if I may. Uh, these were very young fellows that, I don't know, they're just eager and, and it was wide open. And so there's nothing has really stopped them from just doing whatever they wanted to. So the normal kind of conditioning of older generations saying, you know, not so fast son or daughter, uh, there's more to it than that, uh, it just wasn't there. And so these companies just exploded. This one really good idea about search. Wow. Now we've got Google, an incredible powerhouse, Amazon. You, everybody knows these stories, but it's not necessarily the best outcome because we've talked about this for a while. This, uh, this dilemma of, uh, of algorithms that are influencing. And this applies of course, to both the China model, the Silicon Valley model, are algorithms that are influencing our behavior because they, they these systems track us. They know what we want. They know who we like. They know more about us than we often know ourselves. And now AI has entered the picture to analyze all this massive amount of data about individuals and produce offerings which are increasingly irresistible, both economically, commercially, and politically. So that's a dilemma. Onto the scene now. Uh, we have a new idea and a new player. The new idea is, well, why not a public option AI? Why not something like, you know, like healthcare? Why, why not have something different than those two choices? This has been a question floating for a while, and it's a good one. And also now we have uh, India itself. Uh, India is not alone in this. There's a, there's a lot of activity, as we've talked about here, about uh, doing this inside of the U.S., the states in the U.S. seem to have more uh, initiative and maybe less barrier than the federal government uh, to, to pursue this. Governments uh, outside of the U.S., not only India, have been thinking about it, working on it, talking about it, but it's complicated. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how this is how this is possible 
and who might lead it. And so that's a little overlong introduction. I apologize. But uh, Akash, thank you very much for coming in. And, and thank you all for for uh, putting up with that uh, trip down memory lane to uh, here we are today. So Akash, welcome. Please tell us about uh, India's initiative, India Digital Foundation, and how you think this is all going to work. Oh, thank you, Don, and thank you for that great introduction. Welcome all. Uh, I think you have laid out a great groundwork for me to explain why India did what we did and why we are using this term digital public infrastructure. Let me have my slides. So a brief introduction. I work uh, in a digital media foundation, which is like a, it's a non-profit think tank. We advise governments in India and the world, how can they use digital public infrastructure to empower communities at their native countries. You can, how, how Indian different states, provinces in India can empower their own people. And we are, uh, we are working in this space for the last 10, 12 years. And I've been associated with the founders who have made this ecosystem. So let me just share my slides and give you an overview of what, why India did it, what, what we're doing with this infrastructure, what's the larger the democratization thing, what we have done. So uh, let me just share some slides. Here they are. Just a second. Hi, uh, Don, can you see this slide? Yes, I can. Oh, thank you. So uh, I will just explain how we, what we call is distributing infrastructure, how they democratize innovation or how do you... Uh, so there are kind of two ecosystems like Don explained in the world where I think there's a, some chat option. Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, there are two ecosystems in the world. Kind of we, we call two different strategies, which let's say the, uh, the, the governments around the world, the policymakers around the world are following. One is what we call is Western, which is more like private sector-led, uh, private platforms, helping and enabling people to come to, let's say, to the internet, to digital economy. And then there is one kind of Chinese kind of strategy, which is like state-led. So what these two different platforms do is, if you look at the global ad revenues around the world, 95% of these revenues are dominated by just five companies. Microsoft, what we call FANG, Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Alphabet. These are the five companies which dominate and control 95% of the global ad revenue. That means these uh, five platforms have most of the world's iPods. That's why that, that gives them a monopolistic power, that gives them dominant power, that also creates the uh, background for them to ensure how and who access the, uh, let's the internet, which is like a major issue for developing countries for global south who, who have access issues. And on the other side, you have the biggest kind of billion, 1.9 billion active user base, but totally controlled by state authorities. So now we have two different kind of narratives in the world. Either you have extreme private-led uh, platforms, or you, on the other extreme, you have what you call a government-led state-based platforms. Here you have profit, let's say determine, determining the futures of the, let's say, our communities. And here you have state surveillance authoritarianism, which is determining whether you can access a service or not. So what can we do? And I think in that space, India provides a very interesting kind of new uh, kind of uh, way of in in inclusion for having more communities to enter the digital economy, to have access to internet. And also remember, So now just look at this pyramid. Uh, what people ask us when I, when I give presentations to, let's say, folks at World Bank, folks at IMF, for African Union, ADB, why did India choose this kind of, you know, digital public infrastructure? And I always say this, look at India's income pyramid. You have more than 100 million kind of households. That would mean 500 million people, more than the population of, let's say, US, 
and many uh, Latin countries together, more, let's say more than sometimes Europe also, which they are earning less than, let's say, yearly income is less than 3,333 USD combined. So in India, we had this issue that you wanted to include people uh, who are so marginalized, so deprived, and then, then you can't have that what you call Either you have the state-led Chinese model where you dominate, you have state doing everything. And I don't think so. India had that kind of state capacity. Or what you have done, you, you would have innovated for the top 7 million households, which happens in Silicon Valley. You innovate for the top and that percolates down to the bottom. But we had no time or let's say that kind of framing. We had to have products and services which innovates specifically for the, this, uh, what you call was 180, 200, 220 million kind of households. That was the reality Indian policymakers were facing in let's say early 2000s, which we had to grapple with. That how do you include such a big chunk of humankind, specifically in a digital economy, which is growing, which is including, which is providing new services and new kind of products. So that was the larger emphasis, which created all that gave the rise to this idea of digital public infrastructure. And also remember, we have two important things. You have a very marginalized and dep deprived communities, but you also have a very young population. India has a very young, what we call as youngest working age population to 2070. So you have 50 year kind of demographic, demographic dividend, but you also have marginalized society. So you have, let's say the ticket size for them to enter, let's say uh, a kind of an internet is less than $1, less than $2. So there is no incentive for private sector to innovate and build for them. And on the other hand, you don't have government capacities to ensure that you uh, give these services to the let's say, to the to the all the communities like like China did. So you had to have mix of strategies, and and this is what India did. What we call is uh, you would be surprised, and I'm showing some numbers. In last ten to fifteen years, you can see what India's digital DNA is like. You have more than 100, uh, 1.2 billion kind of mobile connections. You have what we call Aadhaar enrollments is like unique digital identity. In India right now, you will be surprised. India has 680 million plus unique bank account holders. Indian internet is 840 million people. And on that internet, you have 750 million plus people who are using social media users. So remember, I always ask people that we could do this Remember, we had two important categories. A very a more than three, uh, 200 million households were deprived, who don't have access to a lot of kind of money. Their let's say per capita incomes are not much. And you also have a young population who, who are aspirational, who want to get uh, to the top kind of services. They want the best products. They want to. They are globalized. They want to uh, get onto let's say Instagram, to, to Meta, to those products. How do you integrate those aspirations and your own real kind of uh, marginal realities which India Indian policymakers had to face, and what we did is, uh, uh, let me just give you what uh, India started with. Uh, let's say in two thousand eight, uh, is like this unique digital identity. So what you did, you gave every Indian a unique digital identity, which meant all Indian citizens right now have a, a sixteen digit number, which is which we call as Aadhaar. Which uh, and your password to that access to that card is not your let's say address or something. It's a biometrics. Yeah, you know, what we do is we take your iris scan and we take your fingerprint to just to ensure that there is no duplication. And we did it in, let's say less than ten years that all Indians, all Indian citizens have what we call as dig, uh, unique digital identity. This was the first, most important thing. What what we did. Second important thing was how to ensure. So remember. Uh, one of the one of the important principles for a, a, let's say a developing economy like India or let's say a welfare led economy or a, a poor economy which is looking to serve these communities is to send welfare payments. And India, in large kind of due to its lower state capacity, used to have a lot of lots of leakages. So our first focus to have a digital identity was to ensure that you send welfare payments without leakages. There is should there should not be more, more corruption. There should be lesser corruption. And how do you do it? You cut the middleman out. And that's why you started to have th this kind of what you call digital uh, identity. When we finished that, when we completed that task, uh, the next task was India was quite unbanked. If you look at it, this is the uh, uh, 
in 2014-13, only 58% of Indians had bank accounts since independence. So you had the issue that most people had unique identities, but if you want to send money to them, they had no access to financial products or let's say banking accounts. So next stage of our development was that how do you ensure that you provide, uh, uh, let's say, bank accounts to all these uh, kind of unbanked uh, communities, which is like 200 million plus households. And what we did, it, which is very interesting, we asked all our banks to use this digital identity because that, that provides authentication. One of the reasons, let me just go to the next slide. Uh, this is the uh, slide what we, uh, we always ask people to go through. That what digitization did for us and through our public infrastructure. Public infrastructure meant that your rails, your, your foundational layer of digital identity was owned and operated by, a, let's say, a public entity. It was not by a private sector because they had no incentives to make a, let's say, digital identity because you know, there was no end game there. But government had to send those welfare payments out. And remember, through that digital identity system, we could open bank accounts because we could, not, we could authenticate people. When you give people digital identity, best thing which I can do is authenticate people, which India did. And you know, uh, as per Bank of International Settlement Study, that digitization process, which we call Aadhaar integration, the digital identity integration, leapfrogged our financial inclusion. If we had followed traditional banking means, it would have taken us, let's say, five decades to get those people into the digital economy. But we could leapfrog and do this in less than a decade. That was the power of digital public infrastructure because public entities came together and built the foundational layer of digital identity. Over that, you created what we call as EKYC. EKYC is uh, know your customer via digital identity. I, I, I reduce the costs. So remember, just imagine you are a banker. You want to open a bank account for, let's say, a, a poor person. The main of the one of the main concerns was that they had no identity. They had multiple documents, and it took the, it took you let the, let's say uh, our estimates are like ten dollars, ten to hundred dollars, hundred dollars to just to authenticate them. Send your person in, get their documents, they go back, and you have to have multiple checks, and then that checks sometimes come in, and that creates a lot of layers of corruption because there's rent seeking. So what we did through digitization, because you have digital identity, I can authenticate you because what is your password? Your biometric, your fingerprints. I could just take a let's say fingerprint device, I can authenticate you on the spot, and it reduced, let's say, the timeline for authentication. That helped banks, other, other kind of government departments to authenticate people and send welfare payments, let's say, to unique individuals in less than, a, let's say, less than a day. And remember, I just want to congratulate our kind of folks who thought uh, thought about those things because India is able to have 99% coverage of digital identity, which means I can send my welfare payments faster, efficiently, and it includes people because now they know their money will directly come to their bank accounts. And that's what we did. In India today, right now, 500 million plus accounts have been uh, launched and opened since 2014. And you would be surprised, and uh, it's such an important thing, most of these bank accounts are, are under the name of women. Massive financial inclusion and social, social empowerment. If you include, let's say, this is studies all across the world, that if you open the bank accounts for women, they spend better, they spend on nutrition, they spend on children's education. They don't waste money, which some, sometimes men do on, let's say, alcohol or uh, antisocial behaviors. So that, just imagine, that digital infrastructure, which was a, a public-led initiative, created so much of uh, inclusion, which and I'll, I'll just show you some on other slides. How that also, also created a private ecosystem where they, can, they could enable and build their own Kind of services because the foundational layer was owned by uh, let's say public entities and then the banks and the other ecosystem developers came in and used this infrastructure which is like digital identity so what we, uh, just to take it back for all of you is like when we call digital public infrastructure is like every indian will have a unique identity because it's publicly owned there is no incentive uh, for profit for me i'm not a let's say a platform where I have to have 200, 500 million users, I have to monetize them, no. It's a government entity 
uh, which which is which we call as unique identification authority of India, which has your identity. It's totally safe. It is uh, encrypted. Uh, it has uh, uh, decentralized ledgers. So and we also have a law backing it. So there's a legis legislative authority on which this foundation layer is made. Second is your paperless layer. What we call paperless is the eKYC. I can authenticate my identity by just by my fingerprint. That makes paperless layer. The next layer which I'm talking about is the payments layer. Uh, this is uh, just to get into, we also have what we call a digital dig locker, which means that all documents which are under your name, remember, because I have fixed the identity, which is, if it's a broader question is who you are. I have fixed that problem because I have digital identities of almost all Indian citizens. So I know that if I, if I really want uh, your documents to be digitally, uh, let's say, be available in a cloud, because I have authentication via Aadhaar or digital identity, I can get all that documents in an app. So in India, if you really want, uh, you have an app at DigiLocker, so your school school certificates, your health documents, your driver license, your, your uh, tax documents can easily be stored on a cloud. Why? Because you can authenticate all those documents by your digital identity. And it's consent-based. Every time they will ask for eKYC, your authentication. And that's the most important thing, that everything is done based on your consent. And that, that is enabled because the foundational layer is owned by a public entity. Uh, this is, uh, so next, remember, we fixed digital identity. Then we fixed banking access. But now an important point was, how do you use those services for other kind of uh, products and services. You need to have mobile phone, mobile phone. Now, uh, that's a very interesting story in India. Remember in 2014, uh, per GB cost, let's say access to internet was $4. Same because the, you could you will only access the top echelons of Indian society who could pay that. $4 is very, very much for a large amount of Indian society. And so that's why your private companies were only focusing on as a top tier, the top seven, the top of the pyramid. But what India did is, remember I'll give you an example of an Indian company which used what we call digital public infrastructure to massively open and provide people internet connections and SIM cards. I'm talking about India's Geo, which is like a Reliance, it's a big, big industrial house. What it did is, in 2015, 2016, they realized that if people can open bank accounts with a matter of minutes, why can't we authenticate people and give them free kind of internet? And because the, uh, because the access to internet was so restricted, if we are able to massively open that access to, let's say, multiple people, we could do, we could do massive kind of inclusion. And that, that's what they did. In last 10 years, because you have, let's say these 700, 800 million people owning a bank account, they can authenticate, uh, let's say their identity. They provided hundreds of millions of people. Let's say the number is, they opened, they provided SIM cards to 170 million people. Just imagine the scale, 170 million people in a matter of 100 days using digital identity and EKYC. And that created, let's say, 200, 300 million people coming into internet and created incentives for the mobile companies, for the internet companies to reduce the tariffs because they have such a massive amount of people coming in. And this is what happened. India has one of the lowest broadband costs in the world, data prices. Right now in India, you can access a GB of internet, which is 5G enabled, which is less than 0 0.005. That, that is because you had digital public infrastructure. And your mobile and mobile manufacturing units also went up because I can open accounts, I can give you people and SIM cards. They would like, like to have mobile phones to access internet. And that created a massive manufacturing boom also. We have 272 kind of manufacturing units, but just two. So this is a massive change. Now just look at it. What another product which we opened was that I now have, let's imagine, as a citizen of India, I have a digital identity. I have a, pay, a bank account. I get welfare payments in my bank account. But how should I ensure that I can do peer-to-peer, -peer, let's say, business payments? Now, remember, 
in the in, in let's say global world or something in west or something you have two major payment aggregators visa and mastercard and they they access just a second i think i am getting the chat sorry uh that they they access they could only access and provide let's say payment services to top echelons of the society because they were charging a fee you will remember mdr margin discount trade they charge merchant uh, the ex specific fees to enable payment systems. Now remember, in India, because our same conditions come in, we have people who are marginalized, who are poor, who can't afford that kind of fee. They, that made India a very cash-based society. And Indian, Indian government's, uh, let's say, aim was how do you ensure you can enable those people who have no bank accounts to use digital payments? What we provided is, which is like a, a marvelous thing is, we uh, uh, we call in India as this is UPI Unified Payment Interface, which is totally interoperable. So in India right now, if you come to India, uh, you can I can send you payment just knowing your mobile phone number. That's your cell number. I just know it. Then it's connected to your bank account. I can send you pay, payment in, in matter of ten seconds. And what it did, and it's owned by a let's say a public private entity, which was totally like a, again infrastructure. The payment layer, the architecture was owned by National Payments Corporation of India, which is like uh, RBI, which is like uh, India Central Bank and Indian Indian banks coming together and building this ecosystem or this kind of tech technology layer where you can send payments to each other and to merchants without any costs. It's zero cost payments. I can, almost like cash. You use your mobile phone internet and sometimes it's totally offline. We also have enabled offline payment. And what it did, it brought those small communities, let's say the ticket size of less than a dollar, coming and paying digitally. Just look at the scale. In July 2018, we were doing only 273 million UPI payments, it's like digital payment. Today, we are doing 13,885 million, almost 13 billion payments in a month because you have more than 300, 400 million people who never accessed internet that they could do digital payment. That was the inclusion which digital public infrastructure did because there was no incentive or private sector like Visa and MasterCard. And I, I have this slide that it prevents monopolization. When we always say DPI, what it did, because it's publicly owned, public private sector, that you have an entity called NPCI, initiated by Central Bank of India with banks, and they all pool in money to have this infrastructure open. That's why it's public infrastructure. Just look at the payments across the world. You will always see two major platform big companies, Visa and MasterCard. In India, you can do, let's say, top class payments using 40 fast payment apps. One of the, let's say, major uh, payment aggregators in India had an issue and within a, within a day, people changed and used. And there was no kind of impact on it. That's what DPI does. It pre prevents monopolization because we are not dependent upon private platforms for mediating our digital futures. And for the inclusion's sake, you need to have a public player or let's say a public infrastructure player where the, that ensures that the inclusion of the most marginalized is always there and is making sure that the payments. So now what we have, just to, just to recall, we have a digital pay, digital identity, you have bank accounts, you have eKYC led authentication. That gives you a digilocker which, where you can store your documents in a cloud. Now you also have free access and zero cost payments. So now remember, you are a poor person. You, you are earning less than a dollar in a day. But your payments, you can access internet freely because the data prices are so low. You can open a bank account, use digital payments, and accept payments. Remember, you are a merchant, let's say a digital vendor in India, can have a QR card, and I can pay digitally to them, and they can access via a bank account. This would not have been enabled had we not followed DPI. It would have taken us 40 years if we had followed a traditional strategy. So India had an imperative that if you want to include those marginalized communities, you have to innovate. Innovate in a way which prevents 
monopolization also, which does not create, let's say, disincentives for private sector. In India, digital identity, like, like I told you, a private player also used EKYC and digital identity to provide services. That's what digital public infrastructure does. You build the foundation layer with participation of public and private, but private sector can come, innovate, provide value additions, create value creations, and build their products. Uh, one of another, what we call in, in India is uh, fast tag. You must have seen, uh, if any of you ever visit a toll plaza or let's say toll collection system in India, 97% penetration, penetration rate. Every car in India has what you call a, a QR code, which is RFID tag, and you can easily have uh, what, what you call digital payment. So I can touch if you want to travel via a state border, the amount is, amount is cut from your internet, from your bank account, because everyone has access to bank accounts. So enabling bank accounts and payments and identity creates these value additions across the digital economy. Now I'm talking more majorly about first section of my, let's say, presentation was focused on government and government needs, welfare, how do you do that? Now this part of the section is how can how do you enable private sector? Because you want to create jobs, you want to create uh, opportunities for startups, for small enterprises to also innovate over that digital public infrastructure. Uh, this is kind of basic that how digital payments have evolved. You have uh, the collection increased to $8.2 billion. So you, now there was no leakages. I could easily track uh, how many cars are traveling in a, let's say, highway. What are uh, what are the, let's say, payment systems? Totally eliminates corruption. This is the most important thing, which I want all of you to focus on. The major reason for India to start the first slide was to ensure that those people who are at the bottom of the pyramid are included, they have access to welfare benefits, and through the, let's say, digital public infrastructure, we are able to do this. In India, you have more than 300 schemes which, are, which sends direct payments to, let's say, uh, welfare payments directly to people's bank accounts. Remember, uh, in US, when you had to send uh, welfare payments during COVID, you had to send checks. And it took weeks for people to get post, post checks and then in cash them. It's a lot of mess. In India, I could send money in people's bank accounts within a matter of minutes. And they will get it in their bank accounts. They can redeem it and use it using UPI, using digital payments. Just imagine that kind of inclusion which we have done, which is almost like uh, like developed world. And remember the beneficiaries, there are more than 1.6 billion beneficiaries who are accessing one way or the another, some element of you know, welfare benefits from the government of India. And we have, you know, just imagine the scale of this. We have sent more than $470 billion worth of what you call payments and cash in kind and sometimes in other ways to people directly. And what we have done, we have saved more than 40 billion US dollars. That's actual saving, which we had lost in leakages had we followed other kind of, you know, had we not followed a DPI strategy or a kind of a digital first strategy. This Akash, is what. This is, excuse me, this is fascinating and impressive, is unbelievable. Uh, where does, we're kind of winding down on our time, where does AI fit into the DPI? Sure, sure. I'll come to this. So okay. uh, I'll come. I'll come to this specific. Now remember, uh, just a kind of a long introduction. Sorry for taking such a long time. Uh, because you have fixed included more than seven hundred million people. Now have access to their data. Remember, as a merchant, uh, and I'll show you what where AI is fitting. Just uh, this is like how we have included farmers. I'll just fast pace it. How uh, farmers were included. They have a platform. We have online platform. This is like uh, this is an interesting case. Just I'll take thirty seconds. In India, what we face is uh, when you get when you get when you retire, you every year to get your pension payment, you have to go to a government office to authenticate yourself that you are alive, you are living, so that they can send money. What DPI did it that you can with EKYC you can easily authenticate someone whether they're living or not. So that was the major inclusion. This is crowd participation. Now. Uh, where we are using AI, it is there. Now, what we have done is, let's say, uh, 
what we call as open network digital commerce. In India, you must have seen around the world, you have e-commerce platforms like Amazon, like uh, Flipkart, like Walmart of the world, uh, Alibaba, who are actually using, uh, let's say, making uh, their platform like 100 million, 200 million, and then monetizing them and charging people 20, 25%. So a merchant who has to enter an e-commerce platform use pays 20, 25% commissions to actually enable uh, a merchant to sell and get discovered and cataloged. What India is doing is we are building this totally in a DPI format. All your services, cataloging search, discoverability is made by open source code totally owned by, let's say, a public-private partnership. ONDC is formulated like India's payment ecosystem. Now, just imagine, you're talking about AI. AI majorly requires your data, how people are buying, your patterns. And those major companies, remember, you can have major companies deploying AI because they have major access to people's data. What are they searching? How they are searching? Uh, what are their buying patterns? How, what are their consumer patterns? What, uh, how do they uh, search a device? How, where do they click? Everything is owned by those platforms. That's why they are, they are able to deploy AI and monetize and provide you services. Just imagine if you have DPI, in, in, uh, for, for India's case, ONDC. Now you can, as a, as a small startup, I can know that which part of India is having which buying patterns, which agriculture community is facing certain issue because they have no searchability and discoverability. I can have massive amount of data for you here. And you can use specific AI. Remember, I know in small province of India that these farming communities are facing certain issues. I can deploy AI to understand their patterns of, uh, of their input growth, input costs, and I can specifically provide them credit. Look at this another slide. One of the reasons in India is that you are a small startup or a small business. You have, you face credit issue. You never get access to credit because there is no documented history. Because now I have data, I have your payment information, I have your bank account information, I have uh, your buying patterns. But let's imagine you are on only this, which is an e-commerce play. You are selling your, uh, let's say, products and services. Because it's a public data, I can access it. Remember, most AI companies use data which they have access to by providing free services. You go to Twitter, you go to Meta services, Google services, they're providing you free email services, free social media services. And they get that data and build their AI systems. Just imagine if a public entity has that kind of data, they can also provide AI and use AI for specific inclusion purposes. In India, we are doing that. What we call account aggregator is, I have uh, your consent, because the data is totally uh, publicly available, that you use your consent, and I provide that data to top kind of banks, mutual funds, insurance providers. Remember, otherwise, they will have to get each individual's people consent and private platforms to get that data, to deploy AI because it's publicly owned and it's it's encrypted, it's anonymized, I can give you credit because I have some sort of information collateral, which was not available before. That's when in India, you had such a low credit penetration rate. In India, that's the DPI story. Because I have worked for last decade to build and include people, which is more than 500 million, 600 million people, to access their bank accounts, to do daily payments. I know their flow. I know what they're doing, what, what, what are their consumer patterns, how, they, how do they buy, how do they sell. And I use that data to provide them AI-based interventions. So ONDC provides you discoverability search, like an e-commerce play. And account aggregator provides you credit. Because I know that you are selling, let's say, $100, $100 million worth of goods and that is totally digitally available, I can give you credit in a matter of minutes because you consent to share that data, which is publicly available because it's a public infrastructure. That data gets transferred to my bank and then that bank takes a risk analysis thing and then sends you money. That's what India is trying to do. Another thing is, this is what we call as open credit enablement network. 
we have let's say a credit gap of 300 billion 330 billion usd we have small kind of uh, we we have more than 40 million msme you can use publicly available data and, and remember it's an opportunity for around uh, for for every kind of st stakeholder here government can provide priority sector lending to let's say agriculture women led farmers as a fintech you can you can provide lending to let's say top performing msmes if you are a, let's say a big climate fund you can also send uh, credit and specific venture capital to those msmes which are working in climate spaces or you can also send money to people who are let's say farming communities you can also send money because i now have publicly available data of your payment patterns how you spent what are your let's say market opportunity via ondc i know that you have such a big market opportunity. Just imagine if you don't have it, what will happen? Only AI products will come from private platforms because only they have the data of how you buy, what you buy, where you buy. That's what AI is. You understand the data layer. If you don't have data, there is no AI. AI requires your behavioral patterns, what you do. And I can do that precision because it's publicly owned. You have a public entity having the access to data, making the foundational tech layer, you have a law backing it. In India, we call it Digital uh, Data Protection Act, which, which mandates how you use data, what are the consent management mechanisms. So if it's publicly owned and publicly mediated, then your AI will be for common good. Otherwise, AI would be private pockets. That's what DPI is trying to do. Now, I'll give you another example. This is kind of what we call open data platforms in India. You have ONDC, which is an e-commerce DPI. Account aggregator is what we call is totally financial information sharing. I, I will send my financial documents via by a consent to let's say financial fiduciaries, the banks, mutual funds, fintech players. They, they analyze the data and then they give me credit. Open credit enablement network is, how do I rem remember one of the reasons you have low credit penetration is that uh, in India, you have let's say payment cycles of 60 days, 90 days. They, for a bank to fund a 90 day loan is doesn't make business sense. But just imagine if I reduce the cost of acquisition of that customer by providing that open access to data, I can provide you a week, a week day loan. Let's say uh, loans for week, for a day, for 10 days. This is what is happening in Indian startup ecosystem. That you have fintech companies coming in because the foundational layer, the data understanding and data, the procurement of data and the consent is totally made by public infrastructure. Otherwise, I have to pay every private company for mediating. This is uh, super uh, impressive, Akash. I, uh, you know, I'm just uh, so unaware of the scale of this uh, project and it's different. It's new. And, uh, so uh, we're just running at the end of our time here. I wanted to see if anyone had questions, and there is one. How does one yeah. access the DPI data? I'm informed each time someone accesses my personal. Am I informed each time someone accesses yes. my personal data? Yes. So uh, let me just uh, 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 read this and stop this. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Uh, just for just to get this, every time a data is shared, it is consented by your eKYC. So what what we, what what does it mean is, if someone is accessing your data, you will have to authenticate it via one-time password, which is to which goes to your email and to your mobile, your cell phone. Only when you give that access can they access your data. Uh huh. Otherwise, they can't access your data. Every which every data sharing layer we call in India, I could not go deeper. We call it data empowerment and protection architecture. It's also open source standardized protocol where every time you need access to my data, you authenticate it via my identity. Well, okay. So these uh, these these AI models are extensive uh, projects, huge yeah. projects. So. India is spending, investing this kind of money on this kind of software? Yes, yes. we have uh, an India AI mission. Uh, I could not tell you, uh, we are also making Bhashni, which is like uh, 
it's a, a, a Indian languages based LLM where you crowdsource like a public infrastructure. We have always had this public infrastructure mind. How can I crowdsource data? Can people contribute and give their time to authenticate whether this, what I'm trying to say means really in that local language? Yeah. And you build LLMs over it. And Satya Nadella talked about it, that how GPT was integrated by using Bhashan, which is like, which is like a translation engine. Which is totally public infrastructure. You and I can use it. You can integrate that engine in your company. So it's totally public sector. Then it's publicly available. There's no charge. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, question from Judith Hellerstein. Judith, welcome. Hi. Uh, yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is: I know you brushed on it really slightly, but the original author had a lot of um, data security issues and being hacked in there. And I know the newer versions don't have that, but I, you talked about putting them all in the GT locker. And then that is also um, uh, concerning is that now that ev if everything's in there, now everything can be hacked into at one time. And what type of protections do you have on that? And, um, and then the second question is, is that, when it's authenticated, what does the person, what actually does the information as the person get? Is he giving everything or is it only certain information that is exactly needed at that time for the authentication that is given? So I have two questions there, but thanks. Uh, thank you, Judith, for those questions. And these are very important questions. Uh, first question on privacy. Uh, Yes, we faced like any digital ecosystem. I, I can tell you all digital ecosystems around the world will face some element of uh, leakages uh, or there, there are always works in progresses. You will always find people who are hacking into the system. But what are the protections? Let's just focus on that. Uh, first of all, it's backed by a law. Most no private platforms services are backed by law. They're just backed by terms of service. In India, Adhar, it's a public entity backed by laws made by Indian parliament, judicially reviewed by India's top court. So every which, every every section, every kind of movement we do in Aadhaar is totally publicly scrutinized by by legal system, by your lawyers, by your, uh, uh, let's say, politicians, by your legislators, then by your judiciary officers. Highest level of accountability. On the second question of your digilogger, that's a fair, that's a design question, Judith. I tell you because uh, either you go for efficiency gains and then you centralize things that creates, like you said, leakages issues. If if the database gets accessed by, let's say, a non-state actor or let's say a malicious actor, that is a risk. But what we're trying to do is, can we deploy decentralized ledgers there? That's a more kind of tech issue. You want to have people access their own, let's say, uh, identity documents across different government departments in one unified place. But the, let's say the storage of each document is with their separate, separate kind of uh, databases. So let's say if you're using driving, driving license, that license is the stored, that part is stored in the cloud of the, let's say, transport department. DigiLocker is just accessing your uh, data, only one person's data, because you are consenting to it. You are taking that data on your own consent, and I want that uh, in my DigiLocker. Like, just imagine if someone takes that access. But that does not mean that DigiLocker itself has, let's say, uh, hundreds of documents coming in together. No, it is just relaying an information from different databases, which you have consented that you relay that information of database for my own use, which I want to keep in my locker. But that the DigiLocker itself will not have all the documents. It will only have access requests when you access it for people to have in their unified app application. DigiLocker is like a relay. It is just asking different databases that can I host this because this person has consented and asked me to host this. So it's a design issue. If you want uh, other things would be like you have totally cent decentralized every Every department have their own databases, and you have to go to each department to access those cards. Let's say if I want to authenticate, then th that's a design issue. And India has followed more centralized thing, uh, but whether the risk concerns are higher, for sure, any centralized mechanism will have more risks. 
Akash, a couple of uh, participants have, uh, have brought up uh, GovStack coalition as a comparison. You're part of it. You're part of it. Uh, how does that how does that work? So uh, what we call is like, uh, can we provide uh, government services as open source uh, API layers? Uh, what we call is uh, India Stack is also that that you provide uh, what we call deeply the technical answer. What we call public infrastructure and digitally means is not like that you you make cells or let's say cars or let's say digital data cables as owned by government. No, what you're doing is if I have databases of my identity, of my payment systems, or my banking systems, I provide you open source APIs to access them. So let's say in India, if you're a small startup, tomorrow starting your own, uh, let's say, company, and you want authentication, either you make your own ecosystem and build identity systems to authenticate your users, or either you use Aadhaar-based authentication. What that means is you ask access requests. So every access request is go goes to the Aadhaar ecosystem. Just, just to ensure that whether that customer A, B, C are actually customer A, B, C or not. So what Gov, GovStack is doing is similar. That can you provide all those government services as stacks, as open source stacks? That's if you want to do digital payments across the world, can I provide the foundational layers? Or simply speaking, uh, email protocols are stacks. They are open source, SMTPs. You don't access. You don't ask a government of, uh, let's say, Germany, when I have to send a text to Germany from, let's say, India, because the underlying layer is totally open source and tech stacks, which is like no one owns it. Gov stack is a larger, let's say, movement that you create cross border and digital services specifically, which are meant for citizens as open source stacks. No one government or let's say a one, uh, let's say, entity should own it. It should be public available like internet consider that as an internet analogy which is this is this larger emphasis that you want to digitally innovate everything don't monopolize either to a government or to a private entity let it be a community owned which is it's an open source communities kind of stacks come from that kind of community space uh huh so this is kind of the uh the standards exactly. question how to exactly. establish standards where nobody actually has control um uh, part of your uh, paper mentioned India's desire to uh, share this capability with uh, low and middle income countries. Yeah. Um, so what is it? Are they getting access to your cloud or are you no. forcing out the entire system or how does, how does that work? I'll tell you, Don. So what, what happened? India had an open source vaccination uh, platform. What Indian government did is we gave full code how to operate it, what to do it as open source on GitHub. Any com any country, any country policymakers want to implement that platform, there is no proprietary. In no DPI in India is proprietary. If you want to build digital identity, how India did, you can go and access what was the actual code, and you can build that. So what we, what India is providing, let's say globalization DPIs. Globalizing DPI means is this, that the tech layer, what we have done as technology, this coding, the specific API management, how do you process the APIs? How do you, how do you uh, make uh, processes around it? That is totally open source. And we have uh, uh, in different that's the departments of India, they are doing actual technology partnerships that if you want knowledge from India, if you want companies from India to build it, you can do it because remember like yoga, it's open source ecosystem. You can build and do whatever you want to do with it. We are not here like Amazon or let's say different things. Right. We are not actually looking at uh, uh, building and you know monopolizing. India, India is like you provide that service as as it is, and the code is totally open. If you want specific technology partnerships as a system integrator, we do help help them by let's say linking them with private enterprises. Yeah. All right. Uh, one last question. We've run over, we're starting to lose some people, which is understandable, but uh, yeah. uh, language. So English is the principal language of, of India, I think. Is that correct? Or is that just prominent? I would Hindi? say official language. It's official language. Most of the government business and let's say business language is in English. 
but the internet, the users are not uh, communicating or talking on the internet in, in English. Mm -hmm. You have, let's say, more than 20, 22 official languages, and most of your services, WhatsApp, Facebook, people are using in their own native languages. Indian Prime Minister also uses vicious people in specific native languages. And the next stage of growth will also come from vernacular local languages. That's why the next, uh, I, I could not share, the, the data platforms layer, India is trying to build an open source translation ecosystem, which is Bhashi. Oh. That how can I co communicate in different services using my own native tongue? Because the data is totally public, public infrastructure, that kind of thing. Wow, that's that's a big task. Uh, but uh, it's been one you of the... Do it. Yeah, it's been one of the sore points of the internet since the first day, you know, it's... yeah. We all have to learn English in order to use this internet. So that's good because there's so many people that do not or would rather not. And, uh, well, they need to be accommodated because it's a valid point. Uh, I think we're going to have to close here. Uh, this has been great, been extremely educational and enlightening. I think the, the, the initiatives is laudable uh, on its uh, intent uh, and its it's different. It's, it's third way, I guess you could call it. Yeah. It's not. It also looks like, if I may just add one more point, it doesn't seem like it's very far from a central control model like China. So in the hands of a government that is not so liberal and benevolent that it could be used for control purposes. Is that fair? Or is there a protection built in somehow? Uh, there's a protection built in. So let's say uh, most of your ecosystems are backed by law. Uh, can you? That's a larger political theory question. Do you think laws by instrument of people uh, can be used by authoritarian governments? Yes. That's a larger difficulty, difficulty which I don't want to get there. Uh, but there are protections there. There are active civil society pressures not to make them. Like Ludit said, not, there's a larger question of centralized. That if you build central systems, you will have, uh, let's say, malicious players coming and deploying them for nefarious purposes. Hmm. That and governments can be like them. So let's yeah. say, but uh, can I use people's payment patterns uh, and identify them? It's difficult to do. But can I get access to people's payment patterns? But you need that for AI building also. So it's a it's a it's a difficult territory to operate. Don, you want to have access to people's uh, ways of you know, communicating how they're doing, what, to build the AI ecosystems, to make them efficient users. In it. But can it be used uh, by nefarious people? Yes, most technologies can. Well, it can. It's true. So we're we're stuck with ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> There's no escape. Uh, thanks again. This has been great. We'll have the recording up uh, hopefully tomorrow and um, hope to have you back and engage in this uh, topic as things develop. And uh, oh, sure. here, so appreciate your time and best of luck. Thank you, Don, and thank you everyone for participating. And it was lovely talking to you, all of you. Great. So with that, uh, we will sign off somehow here. Yeah.